The Glass Woman was designed and built in Dresden in 1936. The transparent model demonstrated both the technological genius of its German creators and their desire to reveal the hidden mysteries of human biology. The Glass Woman was exhibited around the world and came to symbolize the Nazi dream of perfecting the Aryan race through the application of science. Nazi Germany was the first of the 20th century totalitarian regimes to co-opt scientists and medical practitioners. The involvement of scientists in Nazi policies made it all possible. The Nazis were special in the way they used doctors because they assigned them a biological mission of purifying Germany, the world, and in that sense, the doctors were much more central to the Nazi vision. And that's why Hitler said at one point that the, uh, the medical profession is more important to the Nazi regime than almost any other. By 1945, Germany was in ruins. Its leading doctors and scientists had fled or stood accused of crimes against humanity. What had happened to science under the Nazis? This is the story of the Nazis' favorite science, human biology. The German Hygiene Museum was one of many renowned scientific institutes which enthusiastically cooperated with the Nazi dictatorship. The Dresden Museum played an active role in the Third Reich propaganda machine. It made films which told German citizens that it was their duty to become the fittest nation on earth. Durch das Deutsche Hygienemuseum und seine Lehrmittel wird allen Volksgenossen vor Augen geführt, dass sie ihre Gesundheit bei vernünftiger Lebensführung erhalten können und müssen. Government funding for biology research increased tenfold during the Nazi years. Doctors soon made up the largest professional group amongst SS officers. The doctors in turn became instruments of state oppression. Long before Hitler waged a war on the world, German physicians went into battle against their fellow citizens. It was Hitler's intention to breed a new, absolutely pure race of Nordic Germans, all as blue-eyed and blonde as possible. And I assume that many doctors were somehow inspired by this idea and went along with supporting it. And anyone who did not fit into this grand scheme had to be destroyed or even prevented from coming into being. The Nazi biological revolution was not forced by politicians onto scientists. Rather, an elite group of eugenicists had inspired it in the first place. Eugenics was at the heart of Nazi policy. Like gene therapy today, the science of eugenics proposed that by selective breeding, mankind could wipe out diseases and produce a fitter people. Eugenics was an enthusiasm which swept through scientific and medical circles from 1900 onwards. And it was global in the sense that there were eugenic enthusiasts in North America, in uh, India, Japan, China, as well as most of uh, Western Europe. And um, it was also uh, entirely cross-party political in the sense that there were as many left-wing eugenicists as there were right-wing eugenicists. Eugenic's greatest champion in the 1920s was the wealthy amateur research scientist, Dr. Alfred Plertz. He gave eugenics a new name and a racial aspect when he introduced the new science to Germany. 
My father invented the term racial hygiene because he believed that the race, this eternal life stream of mankind, that this needed a certain hygiene in order that all the defects in humanity's genetic inheritance would not go on reproducing themselves. Ironically, it was the American eugenicists who came up with a radical solution, forced sterilization. In over 20 states, sterilization was legalized. By the beginning of the 1930s, some 15,000 Americans had been sterilized in prisons and mental institutions. German eugenicists looked on in envy. Adolf Hitler read the most fashionable German eugenics textbook while he was writing his political manifesto, Mein Kampf. The German state must see to it that only the healthy beget children. Here, the state must act as the guardian of a millennial future. It must put the most modern medical means in the service of this insight. Those who are physically and mentally unhealthy and unworthy must not perpetuate their suffering in the body of their children. Hitler's whole political vision was part of a biological truth. And that biological truth was that the Nordic race had been suppressed and rendered ill by inferior races, and notably the Jews. It had to be released from the influence of the Jews and other inferior races in order to become strong, benefit itself, and benefit the world. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they set their sights on left-wingers and Jews who were systematically purged from all areas of state employment. From March 1933, no one the regime defined as Jewish could work in schools, universities, or state-run hospitals. Many young scientists who came from Jewish families decided to leave. One of them was Max Perutz. Well, it was the anti-Semitic legislation in Germany which came as a shock. At the university, as a Jewish-looking student, you entered only at the risk of your life because it was infested by Nazi gangs. One day, the Nazi gang came into this seminar and picked out an invalid, handicapped Jewish student and beat him up. Germany at that time was the leading scientific country and had been for some years, particularly in subjects like uh, chemistry and, and medicine. If you wanted to be a medical research worker, you had to go and study after you qualified in Germany, just like nowadays you nearly always have to go and study in America for a short time. And as a student, I went to Frankfurt and that was a very interesting experience because it was after the Nazis had come to power. Uh, and uh, I went to one lecture given by a radiotherapist who uh, was an active Nazi, uh, and he gave us a lecture uh, on radiotherapy, and he showed a slide which has stuck in my memory ever since because I think it was just about the foulest thing I can remember having seen. He showed a slide of X-rays damaging cancer cells, and the X-rays were illustrated by having Nazi stormtroopers sort of seated on the ray, and the cancer cells uh, were Jews. And I think this is about the most foul thing I... Well, it's certainly the most foul thing I've ever heard in a lecture. The effect of anti-Semitic legislation was immediate and dramatic. In Berlin uni University, 42% of the doctors were Jewish, according to uh, the Nazi definition. So. 42% of the doctors were kicked out, of the professors were kicked out, and, uh, and assistants were kicked out. And this meant that, of course, for the junior people, there was a tremendous chance of getting a job, yeah? 42%, you know, and, and of course, some of them being old, so the whole, whole medical faculty rejuvenated, became young again. And that is, of course, always wonderful if you can say, you know, finally all these old bastards are out and we are now a young faculty and, and so on and so on. I think the physicians joined the Nazi parties uh, at a very large scale. 
because of several reasons. The most important are they came back from the First World War, they were unemployed, and there was a high rate of unemployment uh, amongst physicians. The Nazis were promising jobs. They were promising posts in clinics uh, uh, for free physicians uh, in, the, in the town and the cities. Dr. Eric Hessler is one of the few living witnesses to that time. He was a 34-year-old junior paediatrician in Leipzig in 1933. An active Nazi party member, Hessler suddenly found himself promoted to head his department when his Jewish colleagues were forced to emigrate. The Leipzig Children's Clinic was simply known as the Jews' Clinic. And I must stress that in those days, on average, every other pediatrician was a Jew. I'm not saying they were bad doctors, but they took the jobs. It was a struggle for jobs, a struggle for existence. If the scientists had, had united and said that we are not going to accept the jobs of those who have been kicked out, then uh, the whole thing would not have worked. But it's completely impossible because only one person did that. And nobody, had the car nobody else had the courage and, and the decency to do so. Everybody else was just enchanted. You know, it was kind of bad taste, but still, you know, you do it, yeah. And you get this wonderful job, so why shouldn't you do it, yeah. Taking the jobs of their Jewish colleagues was just the beginning of a pact between German doctors and the Nazi regime. It was the first step in a journey that would turn physicians into killers. After the 1933 takeover by the Nazis, anyone in Germany who worked in the state-run medical system had to become a member of one of several Nazi health organizations. These organizations excluded anyone of Jewish descent. Hitler's propaganda claimed that Jewish people threatened the health of the Aryan population. For scientific evidence, he looked to eugenics, or racial hygiene. Hitler's basic drive was anti-Semitism. But, of course, in this respect, the scientists, the biologists, were very useful. They were not particularly anti-Semitic, but they could give them reasons for anti-Semitism. And they got all the money and all the support from the Nazis because by pushing racial hygiene, they also pushed anti-Semitism and gave anti-Semitism what they claimed a, 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 a scientific basis. One of the strongest propagandists for racial hygiene was Dr. Alfred Plötz. As a Nordic supremacist, he agreed fully with Hitler. My father was a supporter of the Germanic race. Once, for example, when I was a little boy, he took the globe and said to me, look here, this is where law and order and modern civilization predominate. And he showed me the countries on the globe, from New Zealand, Australia, northern Italy, northern France, England, Scandinavia, Germany and North America. And of course, as an impressionable young man, that made me feel that the Nordic race, the Germanic race, was the salt of the earth. The race scientists embraced the Nazi regime of what they would call the National Socialist Revolution. Uh, they were enthusiastic supporters because they saw, as some of them indicated publicly, in Hitler and his movement, the first politicians who fully understood and supported eugenics. Financed by the Nazi regime, eugenicists set out on a nationwide mission. Their aim was to record scientifically what exactly it was about the so-called Aryan people which made them so superior. Racial hygiene had become definitively racist. German eugenicists wanted to prove that other people, such as Jews and Gypsies, were statistically more prone to disease. 
clearly there are hereditary diseases. I mean, this isn't fiction. What is fiction is the notion that there is an Aryan race with its roots deep in ancient history, which is superior uh, in its uh, qualities to other races. Uh, and it's completely bogus to say uh, that this superiority is being eroded by the racial tuberculosis of uh, intermarriage or sexual relations with other races, inferior races, particularly the Jews. New laws forbade relationships between Jews or gypsies and Aryan Germans. Local government forced gypsies into makeshift camps. But these minority populations were not the only targets of racial hygiene in Nazi Germany. The so-called Aryan population was investigated for hereditary diseases. A vast research campaign took place, led by one of Germany's top genetic psychiatrists, Dr. Ernst Rudin. Rudin benefited from the Nazi regime's passion for eugenics, as his daughter remembers. He hoped for uh, financial support, and after uh, 1933, uh, additional money came from the Ministry of Interior, uh, from the German Emergency Fund of Sciences, and from the Reichskanzlei. And all in all, Rudin had much more money after his dis for his disposal uh, after 1933 than before. Solches Leben ist Gift für die Gesundheit. Wer gesund bleiben will, muss auch gesund leben. Im rhythmischen Ablauf von Arbeit und vernünftiger Erholung wird die Gesundheit gehegt und geschont. There was a positive side to eugenics, which Nazi propaganda was keen to stress. A healthy people would be the only ones fit to breed the master race. A national campaign was put into place to screen the population for disease. Alle Volksgenossen sollen von den Röntgenschirm kommen, damit jede Infektionsquelle rechtzeitig erkannt wird. Money was poured into a nationwide health program. The aim was to breed a new generation of superfit Germans. Erste Forderung. Der Säugling ist von der Mutter so lange wie möglich zu stillen. Wichtig ist daher eine gesunde Lebensführung der Mutter. There were large financial rewards for women who had lots of children, and there were fines for childless couples. The result was a baby boom during Hitler's first five years in power. The health ministry boasted that one million more children had been born because of the Nazi breeding policy. One of the images I always have in my mind when I think of Nazi Germany is of girls in swimsuits throwing beach balls around or jumping through hoops. This is not some great Nazi health club everybody has just joined. You're doing it to make sure that the women produce as many uh, uh, Hitler youths as, as possible are, are fit reproductive uh, machines. But it was not enough just to increase the birth rate. Hand in hand with the baby boom went what was known as negative eugenics. Doctors began to play God, instructing their patients on correct genetic policy. Sie heiraten doch nicht nur, um, na sagen wir, um mit einem geliebten Menschen ständig beisammen zu sein. Schließlich wollen sie doch auch Kinder haben. Also, und Kinder setzt man nicht in die Welt, damit sie da sind sondern es sollen gesunde, wertvolle Menschen werden. Und darum ist es wichtig, dass man seine Körperverfassung und seine Erbgesundheit prüfen lässt. Propaganda films made it look as if people could still make choices. In reality, doctors exercised more power over their patients than ever before. New Nazi legislation meant doctors could force sterilization on their patients. Germany's leading eugenicist, Dr. Ernst Rudin, welcomed the new law. 
First, he was absolutely in favor of voluntary sterilization, but then uh, in the course of time, but it took a long time, he got convinced that this wouldn't work, and he supported uh, compulsory sterilization. The law for the prevention of genetically ill offspring was passed in July 1933. To put the law into practice, the authorities used evidence of inherited disease, which had been gathered by the eugenicists. The methodology used by the eugenicists was certainly acceptable in its time and probably as well as could be done. On the biological level, their conclusions could not really be disproved until the later 1930s, and especially after World War II with the discovery of DNA and other advances in the hard sciences of genetics. From now on, confidential medical files could be used against every German citizen. Many of them had reason to fear a visit to their GP. On the shores of a lake, 90 kilometers north of Berlin, is a now abandoned estate waiting for a new owner. The local mayor, Dr. Wolfgang Köpp, knows its dark history. In 1935, the Führer School, or the Leadership School, was opened here by Hitler's right-hand man, Rudolf Hess. Thousands of Nazi doctors, midwives and nurses were trained here on special secret courses. Um, sie konnten sich nicht freiwillig zu diesen Lehrgängen melden, sondern sie wurden They couldn't simply volunteer for these courses. They were specially selected by the Nazi party and by the SS organizations and especially by the party health organizations. Information it is very telling that all the information about these training courses was published in all German doctors' journals until the year 1937. From then on, nothing more was reported about the content of these courses, only the dates. And the closer it came to war, the more secretive everything became here. The Nazis built a new campus, complete with lecture halls, laboratory and dormitories. Doctors, nurses and midwives were sent to the leadership school. Here, they were trained to perform some of the worst crimes in Nazi medical history. Some went on to carry out experiments on human beings in the concentration camps. The lessons taught at Altreza were hidden from the German people. They were told it was a center for training sports doctors and an Olympic stadium was built as part of that deception. Physicians were trained in leadership. One of the places where, where this took place uh, was Altreese, a whole campus for the education of physicians, more than 30,000 in leadership as a physician. In my opinion, any education in leadership for physicians is combined with a lack of humanity. The doctors and nurses who attended the leadership school had to prove their own athletic superiority on the sports field. But more importantly, in their genetics classes, they were indoctrinated with the Nazi idea that the Jews were a diseased people and that the disabled were lives unworthy of life. Doctors were taught how to sterilize and eradicate the unfit. The medical profession had been widely trusted in the past. But Nazi doctors and nurses abandoned the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. I don't get the feeling that ethical training was particularly important to any, any form of uh, medical education and that it was a type of bolt-on, wishy-washy extra and that once uh, these people were actually, actually practicing medicine, the, the Hippocratic Oath was just something that you hung on the wall rather like your medical degree certificates and didn't pay much attention to it. At Altreza, German doctors embraced their new role. They were taking part in a great social experiment. They were to become the creators of the master race. 
you've got to look at Nazi behavior in the medical profession and elsewhere as a mixture of idealism and terror. We know about the terror. We often neglect the elements of idealism. We don't like to hear about that. But the Nazis held out to German doctors the idea of being biological soldiers, cultivators of the genes, physicians to the folk, all these being very ideal, the idea of doing great work for the people in general that transcends the selfishness of a one-to-one -one doctor patient relationship. Doctors cease being just concerned with, with a sick individual who you might not actually be able to do very much for, and you take on this grand redemptive racial biological mission where you are part of the elite expert group. The regime was offering the doctors the chance to become godlike figures presiding over the nation's genetic health. After the war, doctors and scientists pleaded that they were only following orders. Dr. Kerb does not accept these excuses. It's often claimed today that it was the National Socialists who forced or persuaded German doctors to take up genetic biology and racial hygiene. That is simply untrue. It was not the doctors who were persuaded by the National Socialists. It was the other way round. Under the Nazis' 1933 sterilization law, German doctors had the power to hunt down those they believed to be genetically unfit. They made films to warn the public to be on the alert for hereditary illnesses in their family. Von neun Kindern sind nur vier groß geworden, zwei Jungen und drei Mädchen starben kurz hintereinander an Diphtherie. Und wie viel wertvolles Erbgut ist dadurch verloren gegangen? They wanted to seek out abnormality wherever it might be. And one of the most grotesque examples is that school children were asked to draw up trees of their own family members, family trees. And the teachers would then be able to identify the fact that there was something wrong with, say, Uncle Fritz. Uncle Fritz would then be reported to public health authorities who might well put in an application to have Uncle Fritz compulsorily sterilized. We pflegen Sie. Aber wir verhindern ihre Vermehrung. Solche arme Wesen sollen in Zukunft nicht mehr neben unseren gesunden Kindern leben. Die Unfruchtbarmachung ist ein leichter chirurgischer Eingriff, ist ein humanes Mittel, durch das die Nation vor grenzenlosen Elend bewahrt wird. Mein Vater war ein idealistischer Utopist wie die meisten dieser Leute und man braucht solche Utopien. My father was a utopian idealist, like most people of that kind. And you do need utopians to get things done at all. At any rate, my father must have thought in the end, thank God, at least a few hundred thousand idiots and people who would never have been able to find happiness in their lives because they are inadequate, will at least be prevented from reproducing themselves and bringing new inadequate children into this world. Actually, I had a very nice childhood, you know. There were so many nice children in our street with whom I got on very well. And we had a lot of fun playing together. And really, until the Nazi period began, it was all very nice. Then, when in 1933 the Hitler Youth was formed, all of a sudden, all of my friends vanished. They all joined the Hitler Youth. And suddenly, I was very alone. 
When Rolf Thorm was 16, his teacher reported him to the genetic health authorities. He had been born with deformed hands and feet, which made him a candidate for sterilization. His parents were ordered to bring their son to the hereditary health court in the Torm's hometown in July 1937. They brought all their family's health records with them for the sterilization hearing in the courthouse. Here, in this very building, the formal hearing took place with a state medical official during the Nazi years. No one in my family had a similar disability like me, neither on my mother's nor on my father's side. But nevertheless, the medical official insisted that my condition was a hereditary illness. So the outcome was that I had to be sterilized. Rolf Thurm had been reported on by doctors and sentenced by doctors. Doctors not only acted as medical experts, but the Nazi legal system turned them into all-powerful judges. Physicians sentenced their fellow citizens to sterilization in over a hundred such courts in Germany. In Germany, to make it a fast procedure, not to burden the court system, special courts were established, so-called health courts, staffed not by uh, judges, but by a majority of physicians. However, uh, they were, of course, a, a camouflage for what really was a state-mandated medical invasion uh, on the privacy and the person of those condemned to sterilization. It was to be more than 60 years before Rolf Thurm found a doctor who confirmed the injustice of the Nazi sterilization court. Later on, after Germany's reunification, the doctor certified that my condition is never hereditary. It's a mutation in a gene, but it's never hereditary. As a geneticist, Dr. Ernst Rudin knew that other factors could cause birth defects. He was aware that he did not always have enough evidence to justify sterilization on genetic grounds. My father did know that uh, the heredity was not completely clear, and most uh, of the illnesses with a hereditary factor did not depend on a single gene, be it recessive or dominant, but on a combination for, of genes and environmental factors. They were multifactorial. But he thought there is no time to wait <laughs> uh, till uh, more knowledge is available. One must act. He was a very active man. And so he, he thought it's time uh, for action. As an expert witness and judge in the higher genetic health courts, Dr. Ernst Rudin was personally responsible for the sterilization of almost 500 people. They thought the ends justified the means and that um, they would be able to improve the genetic health of the German race as they saw it. And therefore they were prepared to ignore what evidence there was, and there was quite a lot of it, that what they were doing had no scientific basis whatsoever. Germany, under the Nazi regime, was a kind of two determination uh, that, uh, and consistency uh, that was the hallmark in many ways of the Nazi regime sterilized almost 300,000 of their fellow German citizens. Sterilization was carried out in Germany on a huge scale. In every medical school, surgical sterilization was taught as a standard procedure. Medical students watched films of operations and were taught to perform vasectomies and tubal ligations as if they were just routine surgery.
I think the most catastrophic result of these Nazi eugenic policies was, first of all, that uh, about 3,000 people died uh, as a result of post-operative complications, having been sterilised. Secondly, that an enormous amount of psychological damage was done to the people who were sterilised. And thirdly, and perhaps not least, that it compromised the medical profession and that nobody was going to trust their own doctors at the time. Was the death rate quite high amongst women who were sterilised? Was it Pardon, was the death rate? No, it was not very high. But uh, at present, I could look it up. But at present, I can't uh, tell you how it was. It was... I th if now I, I should make an is estimate about perhaps 2% at least. But I think it was lower. The Nazis' aim was to wipe out all inherited physical diseases, such as the ones portrayed in these medical casts of real-life victims. But increasingly, Nazi doctors also targeted psychiatric patients and people with learning difficulties. This resulted in fierce arguments among the Nazi elite over what they called hereditary feeble-mindedness. Since the decision to sterilise people was often made on the basis of crude intelligence tests, Nazi party leaders from some of the backward rural areas worried that their brown-shirted farm boys would not be able to answer questions like who was Christopher Columbus and therefore might actually be sterilised. And as a result of that, on the quiet, Nazi party members were exempted from these sterilisation measures. Sterilization was authorized for such conditions as schizophrenia, alcoholism, manic depression, and feeble-mindedness. Geneticists had no scientific evidence that these conditions were hereditary. I mean, they, they applied it to diseases which are not clearly uh, transmitted by single genes, such as schizophrenia. I mean, the, the child of a schizophrenic patient will not necessarily have schizophrenia. But doctors had long given up requiring hereditary evidence. Increasingly, they authorised compulsory sterilisation on purely social or moral grounds. There are schizophrenic patients uh, especially who urgently want a child because they think uh, their marriage would be uh, better when a child was there and who thought the child would give them new, uh, new joy in life and improvement. And then the result was the marriage was uh, uh, rotten anyway and the patient uh, was very unhappy because the child was loud and needed uh, help and patience and support and they were very often they were unable uh, to give the financial support to the family and so uh, after some time uh, many uh, patients who had wished a child uh, did regret that there was no justification whatever for sterilizing these people. And I think geneticists or medical people in Germany must have misled the regime in claiming that these, these were hereditary conditions. The sterilization law had been based on the idea that diseases are passed directly from one generation to the next. But even by the 1930s, German geneticists were aware that many conditions lie dormant for generations. To eradicate them all would take centuries. This was well known, and in fact even Hitler knew. If you read Mein Kampf, you find there a statement that uh, this program will take uh, at least 600 years to, 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 to give a result. But I think, again, uh, this, this sounds 
so, uh, may sound terribly attractive. You are, you are now involved in a project which is really a huge project, which, which goes down the next, the next uh, thousand years. Yeah, wonderful. Was your father right that sterilization would improve the human race? Was he correct that if it had gone on long enough? Uh, that's very difficult uh, to answer. I think at that time, uh, he was uh, right in some way because uh, there were no safe means of contraception, uh, abortion was forbidden, and so uh, this was the only mean uh, to prevent uh, the birth of, of uh, disabled persons. I'm quite convinced that they knew that it was on a very shaky scientific footing, as was pointed out at the time by very, very distinguished scientists in several countries, but they pressed ahead regardless because essentially they were taking, uh, making a gigantic leap of faith. But selective breeding alone was not achieving the obliteration of the disabled from the German population. Hitler turned to another idea proposed by German eugenicists. The notion that, in the name of genetic perfection, it was right to kill the sick and the disabled. Hitler had been talking about killing chronically ill people in his inner circles since about 1935. Uh, sometime in late 38 or early 39, Hitler and um, Karl Brandt, his favorite doctor who became really the head of Nazi medicine, uh, came upon the idea of inviting, uh, inviting requests for mercy deaths. Hitler entrusted Karl Brandt, his personal physician and close confidant, to handle the hunt for a suitable test case. Among the babies at the Leipzig clinic, there was a possible candidate. In the case of the Dauer baby, uh, dropped into their lap, in 1938, uh, the parents were as members of the SS, the staunch party people, whose child was indeed born with severe disabilities uh, and was uh, housed in the, in the Leipzig clinic. Dr. Eric Hessler was working as a pediatrician at the Leipzig clinic when the deformed baby was born. It happened during a home birth. A child was born without limbs. The mother was so horrified when the midwife held the child up that she screamed, the child has no arms and no legs. So the father took the child from the midwife, took it to the children's hospital and said, we will not take the child back under any circumstances. So now it was in the hospital. The chancellery brought this case to Hitler, who sent his uh, traveling physician, Karl Brandt, to Leipzig to investigate and, if he is convinced of the seriousness of the disability, to order the killing of the baby. The discussion over what to do with the child was top secret. But Dr. Hessler was the deputy chief of the hospital. He knows what happened when Dr. Brandt saw the baby. And as soon as Brandt had seen the child, he left word for the chief surgeon that whatever measures he took, there would not be any court proceedings. So Hitler gave the permission to perform euthanasia, but he did not give a written order. The deformed baby was murdered in July 1939. Dr. Karl Brandt was sentenced to death at Nuremberg for war crimes and crimes against humanity in 1948. It's a big jump from trying to get rid of all bad genes through sterilization so that the bad genes wouldn't be reproduced between that and actually killing people because they're incurable are too much of a burden on society economically. It was a jump that doctors were willing to make. By 1939, German physicians had made the remarkable transition from healers to killers. Murdering the disabled was rationalized by the Nazis as a way to eliminate what they called lives unworthy of life. Perhaps it's difficult for people in liberal 
Britain or North America in the 21st century to understand this because we're brought up to think that one must care for um, people who are sick or distressed or homeless or whatever, but the doctors and nurses were operating within an altered moral framework where they were being told that um, these groups of people were essentially despicable and perhaps not fully human and that it was entirely right to feel disgust towards them. Fundamentally, euthanasia is murder. But in grave times of need, exceptional individual cases can occur, and this I cannot condemn. Besides, it's like this. Total idiot children can't be educated. They don't develop. They don't know any words. They only scream. They have to be force-fed somehow, and they'll never be clean. They are often doubly incontinent. Sometimes they smear urine and feces around if they are not tied down. Anything you give to them as a toy, they'll tear apart. These children are idiots. That's the kind of children we are talking about. Almost 5,000 children were killed by German medical staff during the war years. Although Hitler never passed a law regarding the so-called child euthanasia, he personally authorized a committee to decide which children should be killed. Every doctor and midwife in the country had to notify Hitler's committee when a disabled child was born. The killing program was secretly extended to adults. The Nazis built the first gas chambers in Germany to murder almost 100,000 disabled people and psychiatric patients. Eugenics, which had begun as a utopian scientist's promise to improve all of mankind, became the Nazis' rationale for mass murder. The gassing technology would later be used to kill millions in the death camps.